<laughs> okay, so what's my talk on? Um, it's on hydrological modeling using QGIS, and more specifically, um, a particular um, set of extensions in, in QGIS called the white box tools. So hang on, make sure I get this going. There we go. Cool. So um, quick little ditty about where Wanganui is, um, and with a fantastic map there that uh, courtesy of Ian Reese, the backdrop there. So Ian Reese, he's the most awesome guy if you want to have bathymetric type maps or really, really nice background maps. Wanganui is on the west coast of North Island. It's about mm, five and a half hour drive from here, um, two and a half hour drive from, from Wellington. Um, we have a population of around about 48,000, so not, not a huge city, but big enough. Okay, so a little bit about our GIS stack. Um, and I'll be talking about this tomorrow in another presentation, but um, essentially we've decided on uh, a full open source stack for our GIS, which makes us reasonably unique in New Zealand in, in terms of councils. Uh, so from mobile to desktop to database, services, catalog, viewer, all that stuff that's consumed by the public, the whole lot is open source licenses. And there's a whole bunch of benefits around that to um, our particular council. Um, ranging from cost savings to uh, new functionality, improved service levels, you name it. It's been a really beneficial um, change for council. But anyway, I'm here to talk about using QGIS um, for a little bit of hydro hydrological modeling. And the two aims that we were sort of looking at when we, we sort of started this little project was to have a refresh of our overland flow paths. So in other words, where the water flows around off your, your surfaces, and where the ground depression areas were within the city, because that makes a difference where you want to actually stage development of new, new subdivisions, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so the environment. Um, this is back, I was using QGIS Desktop 3.2. Uh, the main QGIS plugin we used was the white box tools, which are awesome, all right? If you ever want to have a decent set of um, uh, plugins um, around hydrological or, or um, uh, LiDAR tools, uh, the white box tools are a really good place to start. Uh, my particular platform, I'm lucky to have um, a reasonably good workstation with a reasonable amount of memory and lots of CPUs and all those lovely things. Okay. Um, as far as the data goes, um, that DEM represents basically the area that we had um, from a LiDAR survey, survey um, which was carried out um, between 2020 and 2021. Okay. Yeah, so um, white box tools, definitely well worth looking at, not just for hydrological stuff, there's obviously a whole bunch of other stuff it does there, from straight GIS analysis work to remote sensing to terrain analysis and so on. Really easy to set up in, um, in QGIS, um, so you know, don't be afraid. Right, getting into it, the basic processing steps. So we've sort of divided this into two things. We've got the overland flow paths and the ground depression areas. Um, so there's a, various things that we need to do to actually work out uh, those particular things. So identify the sinks, you know, breach the depressions and all these lovely things, right? Um, I didn't really know a hell of a lot about this sort of stuff beforehand. And somebody says, oh, you can do that, Simon. I says, oh, yeah, okay, I can do that. And um, did a little bit of research, found some really good papers online which discussed how you could do this. Um, and basically, over a relatively long period of time, maybe two weeks, um, taught myself how to do hydrological analysis. Okay. So, first step. And you can see along the bottom there, it's telling us how long that particular um, process took to execute, so this one wasn't too bad, um, and before and after. So that's identifying the sinks in our, in our LiDAR data, so the bits where, you know, it's basically a big depression. Okay, and you can see the river in there, which is kind of cool. All right. Um, some other really interesting things um, on that particular um, slide. Um, you'll see there's a nice big black spot here, that's a velodrome. Um, what else have we got? Um, big hole in the ground up here, that's where they were doing a big development on our art gallery. So it was literally a big square hole <laughs> in the ground. Okay, um, next step, um, breaching depressions using least cost algorithm. 
Okay, so what does that really mean? Well, let's just ignore the words and we'll have a look at the next slide and this will sort of explain it a little bit more. Um, the before and after of this particular breach cost and the key things here, if you have a look at this road up here, you can see that it's breached across the road to continue that flow path. All right, so that's essentially what that algorithm is doing. It's, it's allowing um, you to puncture the things in your, your, um, your surface model that you wanna puncture, okay? So in my case, it was things like roads and other weird things. That one took an hour to process. Okay. Um, the next thing we wanted to calculate was for our, our flow accumulation. Um, so essentially, it's calculating all of those flow paths across the, um, the surface and working out how much of the area that is actually going into those particular flow paths. And of course, we do things like uh, extract them out based on um, three criteria. In our case, we were interested in uh, flow paths that had a contributing area of over uh, five hectares. We were interested in between one and five hectares, I think it was, and then anything below one hectare. I think that's right, let's find out. Convert the streams to a vector, so it has some lovely tools to do that. And um, calculating the depression areas, uh, that was pretty quick, one minute. That's not bad to calculate depression areas across the city, is it? Um, and we obviously do some styling as well around these things because the styling makes a, a real difference in how you can actually visualize that data. So in this particular case, uh, I'm using a, a linear range of, of classified values so that you can actually get an idea of um, not just the area that's covered by the depression, but actually how deep it is. Um, and then one of the other styles that we had was we were really interested in, in splitting out the depression areas into two different um, categories. One was um, anything that was uh, below 300 mils and then anything above 300 mils. Now, why do we do that? Well, when you're building a house, generally the foundation is gonna be above 300 mils. So we could look at something like that and say, okay, yeah, it's got a, got a depression area, but it's actually not gonna make too much of a difference in terms of land development because it's, it's actually quite a shallow depression. All right. And of course, we do things like combine those styles together and overlay them over a DEM and all those lovely pretty things. And, and um, hopefully if you'd been to some of the um, cartography sessions uh, yesterday, uh, Niall was running one, you'd be learning some of that kind of stuff, like how, to, how to actually present your data in a, in a meaningful way. In our case, um, I think you'll see the, the bright red lines are the overland flow paths that have a contributing area of greater than five hectares. Uh, and then it's sort of a middle range there of orange, and then I think the yellow ones are sort of uh, uh, less than a, a hectare. Um, and you'll see some depression areas in there which have been, you know, have that lovely gradient on them. Okay, so this wasn't the first time that this had been done, but the, the previous setup had been done 2013 by um, a, a, an engineering consultancy. So we thought oh, this would be a really good idea to actually compare what we've produced against what we had previously. Okay, so um, just to give you a bit of an idea of, of um, the two different data sets, um, the original LIDAR was back in 2013. Um, we had a two metre DEM of that. Um, I've just quickly shown on the, the other side a one metre DEM of the newer stuff and you can see there's quite big differences in um, the accuracy of the LIDAR data. Okay. Um, the coverage area was slightly different. Um, we were covering um, a much bigger um, area and that was so that we could pick up some of the catchment areas that were coming into the city. Okay, Okay. so here's some, some really interesting uh, examples of before and after. So you see the before and after in Putiki in 2013, there's sort of this lovely big red line and then it kind of ends at this, this sort of bank. It never actually reaches the river. All right, so the 2013 overland flow paths were good, but not necessarily great. <laughs> um, and then our lot, you can actually see that uh, the uh, uh, overland flow path actually punctures the road where it should do, and then it, it comes out to, um, to the river. 
Right? So straight away, we were starting to see that we were actually getting much better um, value in our results over what we had had previously. Okay. Which I was quite pleased about because they spent like about 30 odd grand getting the last lot of data. <laughs> and I did it for free. <laughs> right. Um, development effects. Okay, so this is before and after. Um, and you'll probably see up in here, there's like this new subdivision up here, and it's literally been carved out of a sand, um, sand hill. And the same sort of thing has been happening down here. So um, it, it pretty quickly represented um, that our old you know, um, overland flow paths were no longer relevant because of the development that had happened um, in the you know, over the, the next few years. Uh, Anzac Parade, which is on the, the right-hand bank of our, um, our river, um, it's, it's always been prone to flooding, um, but in our 2013 data, we could see that there were depression areas that should have been there that weren't. So that was really interesting. Um, okay. And that's the lower end of um, Anzac Parade, so the same thing was happening. Now, the interesting thing about that is the um, depression areas that we calculated out actually matched really, really well to what we were experiencing when we had river floods. All right, so we were getting you know, another good verification that what we were actually producing was actually reasonably um, true. Right, a um, little bit more there. Um, the interesting thing with this one is that in our particular um, 2021 version of events, um, there's a lot more in, in the way of those shallow depression areas in this area. They weren't really picked up in the 2013 data. Okay. Uh, and College Estate. Um, so, an, again, it's another uh, relatively newish subdivision which has you know, a lovely big flow path coming straight through the middle of it. Um, again, we, we had much more accurate results as to where flow paths were really going and where the depths were in, in those depression areas. Um, and that's kind of what it looks like in, in QGIS. Um, so I'm, I've, I've picked uh, a little place called Tafero there, which uh, is where I happen to play hockey. Um, so that's sort of right in the middle of a basin, but that's all right. Um, we still managed to play hockey in there. Okay, so um, I should probably look at a use We've actually produced this data, overland flow paths, depression areas. How do we actually use it? You know, like, you know, quite often I see this stuff and it's bought and it just sits on the shelf somewhere or you know, it's not really actually used for any meaningful analysis. Um, so we've got a use case and that was looking at um, developable residential land. So what we're re really trying to do is have a look at all the land parcels that are in our uh, general residential zone and work out you know, if they um, fell within uh, certain parameters um, against certain hazards. And depression areas was one of those. So we had a lovely big QGIS model that um, basically produces us um, a, a set of data about which land is really developable in Wanganui City. That's something we didn't really ever have before. And so um, depression areas was one of the major components that sort of slipped in there. Um, there's a slightly closer up version of it. Um, and interesting thing about this is the, um, the data up on the uh, left hand side there, that's um, all being produced um, out of a QGIS model. So use QGIS models, they're kind of cool. All right, I'm just about at the end. Okay, um, one of the other things we do is um, internally we, we've actually taken that same developable land stuff and actually displayed it as a dashboard um, so anybody within council can actually can see, you know, how many how many potential lots do we have? How many potential houses can we fit on certain categories of lots? Um, so that's been really really valuable. Right, um, questions. Right, um, we're, we're going to pass a microphone round because we want to make sure we record these things. So um, I think we've got a question down the back there. Uh, two questions, actually. Um, yes. So the original, was it 2013 data? Yes. Um, seems like the DEM is maybe integer. Was that 
a limitation kind of at the time for computing yeah. power, or was that how the data was? Um, no, it was just our limitations at the time. We we didn't yeah. quite have the the, the, the same sort of skills back then, or the same software. So right, yeah. And uh, second question: that dashboard that you just showed in the last slide, what uh, what was that using? Right. Okay. So, um, and I'll discuss this in the GIS stack presentation tomorrow. But um, we we use a web um, viewer called Map Store, and what Map Store gives us is not just web mapping, but it gives us dashboards and it gives us story maps. All right. Anybody else? Greg. So I think I pretty much, pretty much know the answer to the question. But how important was open data, particularly the lens, uh, lidar capture, and things like that? Obviously, massive. Yeah. You couldn't. No, I wouldn't. Would it be fair to say you couldn't have done what you did? No, no, I wouldn't have been able to do it without that LiDAR data, data, not to the same accuracy. Yeah, it, it was crucial. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Just wondering, did you find anything unusual in the LiDAR data set in the den? Uh, not so bad. I mean, um, we had it, um, obviously, because it went through LINS, we had this QA data set, which is kind of cool. So thank you, LINS. That's always good. Um, and um, the, the weird things were more um, when we were calculating those breach costs and things like that. Uh, it took a little while to um, work out what worked best for our particular terrain. Because right? if, you, if you overdo some of the, the parameters, then all of a sudden you're getting really spurious results, you know, like... It's, it's cutting through multiple roads rather than one road or you know, weird things like that. So the um, great thing about having a little bit of power on your machine is you, know, you can actually run multiple processes at the same time and then just have a look at which, which one worked better. So, yeah. Right, one more question. Um, I was just curious what the model inputs are and... Yeah, we saw that the data. For the land development stuff? Uh, no, more for the hydrological modelling. Right. Depends a lot on, on which algorithm you're using. So um, obviously the, the main one is obviously the LiDAR data. Um, but then obviously once you produce uh, you know an output from that, then that becomes an input for the next process and so on and so mm. on. So is it um, based on a certain rainfall intensity or...? Not in this uh, particular case, although we could have done, all right? So um, so the algorithms are there that I could have actually put in a, a particular um, set of parameters for a particular kind of storm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we were just more interested in ca capturing depression areas and where the flow paths actually went. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay, thank you very much. Give me a, a nice round of applause. Thank you.